Romans, Egyptians, Persians, Babylonians, potentially in mercenary service, Thracians, Illyrians, Dardanians. There's quite a list. Da, 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 da. That's cool, cool. How often do you think about the Greek Empire? Let's not start this again. Hello, my name's Tristan Hughes, the host of the Ancients podcast, and the History Hit team have dragged me into this small room today to answer on this laptop the most Googled questions about ancient Greece. Oh God, so let's get going. Was ancient Greece before Romans? Okay, nice one to kick it all off. Well, at the same time, it's complicated. If we think about the high point of classical Greece, I mean, our mind might immediately think of Classical Athens, defeating the Persians, movies like 300, the Spartans in their red cloaks, the Parthenon, drama, Aeschylus, Euripides, Aristophanes, and so on. If we're thinking of that kind of high point of ancient Greek, classical Greek culture, then yes, like ancient Greece was before the Romans because, let's say, the high point of the Romans, we're thinking of buildings like the Pantheon, the Colosseum, Virgil, and so on, and they are writing, those buildings are being constructed uh, several hundred years later, but it's not that straightforward. We need to stop thinking of it as like a linear line, almost like. Now, Greece, yes, maybe it has its high point before the Romans have their high point with conquering the Mediterranean, but Greece remains important when it's ruled by the Romans. The Greeks and the Romans, they have encounters with each other before Greece is conquered. They fight, they trade. The Greeks influence the Romans too, of course. You look at the Roman gods, very similar to the Greek gods, the Pantheon. I mean, look at Hercules and Heracles, uh, Athena, Minerva, Jupiter, Zeus, so on and so forth. So the Greeks very much do influence the Romans. Yes, I guess when it comes to the zenith of their cultures, whether it's Alexander or the Athenian Empire, and then we're looking at the Roman Empire, then yes, of course, Greece does come before the Romans, but it's not as simple as that. If we go on from that, was ancient Greece a country? No. I'd say the time that Greece was most unified was actually under the Romans, when the Romans create the province of Achaea. But even then before then, you have Greece divided between various city-states, and also sometimes you have leagues, like the Achaean League, the Aetolian League, you have alliances like the Epirot Alliance, the Thessalian League. Uh, the Kingdom of Macedon further north as well was part of the Greek world, although it was seen as very much being on the periphery. But Greece was not one nation. It was divided between lots of different city-states, and many of these city-states absolutely hated one another. Athens and Thebes, Argos and Sparta, um, the Acarnanians and the Aetolians. Okay, not city-states, but they're still peoples that really did not like each other. So this idea of ancient Greece being one country, absolutely not. Was ancient Greece polytheistic? So this is a religion question, and if you know your Greek mythology, your gods and goddesses, if you've been listening to the Ancients podcast, then you should know, because we're doing a series about it at this moment. The answer is yes. The Greeks had a huge pantheon of gods and goddesses. There were 12 or 13 main big gods, and I say 12 or 13 because you get Hestia is one that's often forgotten, but so important, goddess of the half. You've got Zeus, king of the gods at the top, then you've got Poseidon, Hades, Athena, Demeter, Hephaestus, and so on. And then you have smaller gods too, not in that main 12 or 13, but still really important, and one that I'll just say straight away is Helios, god of the sun, but there are also so many others as well. So to answer your question, Yes, the ancient Greeks were polytheistic. Religion was right at the heart of ancient Greek culture, no matter where you were in the ancient Greek world. <sighs> was ancient Greece really hot? Well, yes, it wasn't that different to the climate today. I'm sure it was maybe a little different, but hot, dry summers with the men they would want to be out in the sun as much as possible because their idea of beauty would have very tanned bodies. But with the women, it was very different that actually the Greeks saw beauty in a pale complexion, so women spent most of their time indoors. What did ancient Greeks eat? Okay, this is a fun one. There's a lot of stuff that you can talk about here, 
Let's talk about some of the staples first of all. So let's talk about agriculture, right at the heart of ancient Greek societies, vital for life, these fertile river valleys that you find in various parts of Greece. It's no surprise that nearby them you have some of the most important flourishing city-states of the ancient Greek world. Eurotas Valley, the river Eurotas, you have the city-state of Sparta right there. Main cereals, you have wheat, but the main one really was barley because barley grew better in the soil of ancient Greece. Things they didn't have, didn't have chilies, didn't have rice, didn't have potatoes, but they did have broad beans, they had garlic, they had honey, they had olives, and of course another big thing, they had olive oil, they had lots of that. In regards to meats, you could have pork, beef. If you're one of the elites, you might go hunting, and then that could be, say you're in the kingdom of Macedon, for instance, further north, you could be hunting deer, so venison, or potentially also wild boar. Fish, of course, you're never really that far away from the sea in Greece, apart from maybe if you're in the Arcadian hinterland, right in the mountains of Arcadia, but that can be an also important part of a Greek's diet. There are some interesting additions that you have in an ancient Greek diet, and two of my favorite are these condiments. One is called garum, which there's still some debate of exactly what it is, but it seems to be some sort of fish sauce that was seen as a delicacy, and the Romans really enjoyed this too. But one of my personal favorites is something called silphium, and this is also very enigmatic. It came from the city-state of Cyrene and Cyrenaica, which is now in modern-day Libya in North Africa and it was a very popular herb to be used in cooking. Um, but by the time of the Romans and imperial times, and I think it's even the time of Nero, silphium goes extinct. There's also a thing that the sheep that lived around Cyrene, they had the best meat because they themselves ate silphium and that made them have like, you know, like Wagyu beef today, they were the best type of meat from the sheep if you had sheep from the area of Cyrene. What did ancient Greeks conquer? The ancient Greeks, when they weren't fighting themselves, when you get to the time of Alexander the Great, you see, of course, them conquering the massive Persian Empire. And Alexander the Great, he was a Greek, he spoke Greek. Following them, you see Hellenistic kingdoms of his successors spreading as far away as the Indus River Valley and Afghanistan. And you can see elements of Hellenic Greek culture in kingdoms as far away as well, what is basically the Middle East. The Greeks, I don't know really if it's conquer, but they were also great at creating these colonies in far away places. And that's why you have Greek city-states emerging in North Africa, in Cyrenaica, places like Cyrene, but also in the Crimea, uh, in the north of the Black Sea, you have a powerful kingdom emerging there called the Bosporan Kingdom. You have Greek city-states in Ukraine, on the seafront of Ukraine, a place called Olbia. Marseille, the oldest city in France, was originally a Greek colony. And then also you have a few places in Spain as well. So what did the ancient Greeks conquer? Well, actual conquest through the figure of Alexander the Great, the Persian Empire, and indeed further but also through all of these colonies in many centuries earlier, they colonized places in the Black Sea region and in the Western Mediterranean. What did ancient Greeks discover? I'm gonna take this down two angles, I think. Discover first as in exploration, because I wanna talk about a story of an amazing explorer called Pythias, and he came from the city-state of Marseille, Massalia, which I mentioned earlier. And he went on a voyage of exploration. We have bits of his account surviving that we can piece together. He explored the northern reaches of the known world and then further. He went around northern Britain. He went past the Orkney Islands. We think he went as far as the Shetland Islands. He expanded the geographical knowledge that the ancient Greeks had of that northwestern part of Europe, of the North Sea today. You also have Greeks exploring in the east. There's a figure called Megasthenes who spends a lot of time at the court of a very powerful Mauryan Indian ruler called Chandragupta. We have parts of his story surviving. You have also Greek explorers going into what is probably around the area of Uzbekistan, maybe even Kazakhstan today, following the death of Alexander the Great. But if we also talk about discover in regards to inventions, I could be here talking 
for hours. We could talk about philosophical advancements. We could be talking about mechanical inventions, steam power. I love a story from a particular figure who was living in one of the Western Greek city-states who created this steam-powered bird, a man called Archytas. But of course, there's also things like drama, Greek drama, tragedies, comedies, playwrights like Aeschylus, Sophocles, Aristophanes, Euripides, and so on. You have the development of rational medicine. Hippocrates, this person who's known as the father of medicine, like the Hippocratic Oath today, not clear if that was done by Hippocrates, but you have that oath which stretches back to ancient times. That idea of rational medicine, not throwing potions at stuff, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work in curing certain ailments. You could talk about military inventions. The torsion catapult, artillery, has its origins in the ancient Greek world. That helps Alexander the Great conquer the Persian Empire and others after him, particularly with the Romans. You have massive ships like the Syracusia, which is this huge titanic vessel created for a Greek tyrant in Sicily. In many ways, the Greeks were incredibly open to changes and innovations and inventions. But let's keep going, let's have a look. What have we got here? What did ancient Greeks wear? Now, okay, I'm not the main expert on this, but I'll say some words which I know are like key garments that you see again and again with the ancient Greeks. And I know you can see it on certain um, statues like Koro statues and pieces of clothing like the Himation cloak over the shoulder. You've got the Keton tunic. Women, distinguished women, like a key piece of clothing that you see was the Peplos. And there's a beautiful statue called the Peplos Koroni. I highly recommend you look at that and it really symbolises this garment of Greek women. I guess one of my favourite pieces of clothing though is this thing called the linothorax and I interviewed a professor a couple of years ago called Gregory Aldretti. He has reconstructed this linen armour made of flax and it was super effective against arrows. It was really impressive technology, ancient body armour. Sadly, none has survived from ancient history because linen, it naturally decays, it's organic material. So if it does survive, it has to be in a very rare, unusual context, anaerobic conditions. But we do have depictions surviving in certain frescoes and mentions in the literature. What did ancient Greeks look like? Well, all I'm gonna say about this is if you called an ancient Greek man pale white, he would see it as an insult because for the Greeks, the ideal for a man was to have very tanned skin because it showed that you were out working in the fields as often as you could, you were out. Or maybe if you were a, a leisured man who didn't need to work, it means you were out in the gymnasium, you were exercising, you weren't just huddled in a house all the time. So having tanned skin, was something that you would see many of the men having as a symbol of their, well, in many ways, their masculinity. Because with women, in their eyes, this idea of beauty was for them to have pale skin by staying inside. Spartan women, perhaps less pale because they spent more time outside. Did ancient Greeks invent the Olympics? Well, short answer, yes, they did. But when it comes to the origins of the Olympics, I mean, we don't really know that much. The year 776 BC is thrown about a bit, and there are mythological stories aligned with the origins of these, the most important games being staged at Olympia. For instance, the demigod Heracles during his 12 labors, I think it's after he cleans out the Augean stables, he supposedly founds the Olympic Games at Olympia. Another mythological story closely associated with the origins of the Olympic Games and the Olympic Games themselves is this mythical chariot race of the Greek hero Pelops and the local king Oinomaios. And there are different versions about how this race plays out, but ultimately Pelops wins and he wins the hand of Oinomaios' daughter, Hippodamia. Although he doesn't win through the best circumstances because he wins by cheating. And you certainly didn't want to cheat in the ancient Olympic Games. But regarding the actual origins of the Olympics, we don't know much about, but we do know that the Greeks invented them. Did ancient Greeks party? Well, my mind would immediately go to the ancient Greek symposium, but you could only attend the ancient Greek symposium if you were a man. 
unless you were an Etruscan. That was where women could attend. But elsewhere, and the Etruscans, they weren't Greek. They had connections with the Greeks, but I wanted to point that one out anyway. A symbol of your Greekness, if you wanted to display your Greekness, you would hold a symposium and you'd invite your other men. It would be a test at the same time, testing your Greekness, testing if you are worthy of attending this event. And this event is, is quite iconic of ancient Greek culture. You would go into whoever is hosting the event's house. He would have a particular room called the Andron. They would recline. They would have one hand free. You know, but they would be looking, they would be able to talk to all the others kind of laid out in the room. You have these beautiful drinking vessels survive from ancient Greek times, some of them more richly decorated than others, depending on how much the symposiarch, the man in charge of the party, could spend on the ceramics, on the ware that he was going to show off at this party, the showing off of his Greekness, including a really bizarre drinking cup called the Kylix, which was really difficult to drink from if you've only got one hand free and are reclining. I was talking to Professor Michael Scott about this, and it was really, really interesting. But that in itself was probably a test to make sure you didn't spill it like the barbarians. So yes, the ancient Greeks partied, but only if you were a man. If you're a woman, you expected to stay at home. It was a very patriarchal society, and that's the sad matter of fact with the ancient Greeks. Did ancient Greeks have orgies? Something that has become universally associated with ancient Greek parties and these banquets and would also become associated with ancient Roman banquets too of the elites is that they would descend into absolute debauchery and orgies and sex happening everywhere very publicly. This is more erotic fantasy in my opinion because one, the symposiarch, the person in charge of these parties would determine how alcoholic the wine would be at the start, and also how much wine you would drink, what kind of night you would have. Yes, there probably were dancing girls, there were musicians, there probably were prostitutes that came to these ancient Greek parties, but don't have this idea of them just descending into like this lawless, just sex everywhere, everyone going at it. That is very much the idea of later creation. And with the Romans as well, there is actually no evidence of the Romans like these things descending into massive public sex events. And actually, that really emerges first with the writings of early Christians and then associating it to certain religious rituals of Greeks and Romans, you know, the pagan predecessors. And then that later becomes associated with elite dining and elite parties of the Greeks and of the Romans. So did ancient Greeks have orgies? Hey, I'm sure maybe one or two happened. I'm not saying that they never, ever happened, but this as a mainstay of an ancient Greek symposium, absolutely not. Did Socrates, Plato, Aristotle really exist? Well, the short answer is yes, they did. They absolutely did exist. Aristotle famously taught Alexander the Great. Aristotle himself was taught by Plato and Plato himself was taught by Socrates. You can see, see a line there. Yes, these figures were real. However, one, an interesting concept associated with Plato, Atlantis, isn't real. Atlantis is a fictional literary device created by Plato to help explain, to create an ideal enemy for the ideal city-state in the Socratic dialogue, the Timaeus and the Critias. The city, the power, the kingdom, the empire to challenge Athens some 9,000 years before. And for that scenario, the ideal enemy is this power of Atlantis that supposedly dwelled in the Atlantic Ocean, west of the Pillars of Hercules of the Straits of Gibraltar. But Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, yes, they really existed. How did ancient Greek democracy work? Right, well, this is a bit of a complicated one because democracies weren't all the same in different parts of the ancient Greek world. So a democracy on the island of Rhodes, city-state of Rhodes, differed from that of Athens, of Athenian democracy. And then there's Syracusian democracy, and so on and so forth. Let's, for this, focus in on Athenian democracy as an example, the most iconic form of democracy. It's interesting. You have these various different groups, official 
bodies that help in the original kind of creation democracy supposedly founded by Cleisthenes at the beginning, well, at the end of the 6th century, beginning of the 5th century BC. And you have the region of Attica around Athens divided into various things called deems, almost 140 of these, and these deems were divided into 10 tribes. And 50 people from each of these tribes would be selected to form a body of 500 called Abula. Now this council, this central council, would then deliberate matters and decide whether something should be voted on. And if they decide that it is, they pass it on to the next body, which is a body called the Ecclesia, the Assembly. And it would be in the Ecclesia that they would vote on whether a proposal be accepted or denied. And first had to go through the Bule, the council, and then it would go to the Ecclesia. So if a proposal was passed in the assembly, it's got through the central council, it's now got through the assembly. One of the great things about Athenian democracy is that they then inscribed these motions and then they put them up in the agora, either inscribed or in bronze. And so we have a rich record surviving of decrees, the person who proposed the decree. So you can see there are certain figures more active in a democracy at certain times than others. One last point of democracy that I'll mention here, and this is the idea of ostracismos that you also get in ancient Athenian democracy, where every year the Athenians are asked, they have the option to have an ostracismos. And this is where they vote as to whether they want to ostracize a certain person, supposedly if they are worried that that person is becoming a bit too powerful, that they might become a new tyrant, because democracy emerges in Athens following tyranny. And so you do get sometimes some very prominent figures in the democracy who have gained a lot of sway, who've been there for a lot of time, actually getting ostracized because too many people are worried about what their ultimate aims are. But I think they need to get some 4,000 or 6,000 votes for a person to be successfully ostracized. Likewise, if someone was to become an Athenian citizen and they were a foreigner, you needed some four, 6,000 supporters from the Athenians to vote for you. So it's a big ask. This democracy, it's active and it's working, very different to the democracy we have today, but it is right at the keystone of places like Athens, particularly Athens, for much of their existence. How did ancient Greeks go to the bath? Well, this is an interesting one. It really depends on where you're living, on your status. Certain Greek houses would have had toilets. A fact that I love is that the oldest known flushing toilet comes from the Minoan Palace at Knossos on the island of Crete, and that's Bronze Age. And there are, of course, systems, there are sewer networks and systems in many of these big ancient Greek city-states. You can see architecturally surviving, archaeologically, places such as Ephesus, there are lines of toilets of what were public toilets still there, and you can go and see them today, they're absolutely brilliant. But of course there were other houses of ancient Greeks in cities that they wouldn't have had a toilet. And we know that chamber pots were very popular. So if in the middle of the night you might have a chamber pot between a whole family and then have to empty it the next day. Now I don't know of any direct evidence for this, but you can imagine you know, groups of these people who didn't have a toilet and they have a chamber pot actually just throwing the waste into the nearby street, getting rid of it. And then you know that's for someone else to deal with. So, that's the more smelly part of certain ancient Greek cit um, city streets, no doubt. How did ancient Greek texts survive? One answer to that is the Romans. The Romans did preserve a lot of ancient Greek writing and you know, looked at those texts, whether they're philosophical texts and so on and so forth. You also have libraries across the Greek world. The most famous is, of course, the Great Library of Alexandria, when Ptolemy I, he orders a guy called Demetrius of Phaleron to start getting a copy of every text in the world so they have a copy in the great library there. But of course, that library did ultimately burn down. But still, those texts no doubt would have been copied. And then sometimes it is just luck. Some fragments of certain sources that don't survive. We only know the names of certain writers because they've been preserved in the writings of others and they are sometimes labelled as fragments. 
We have epitomes of earlier writers written by people maybe as far as in like the Byzantine period, so a period I'm very interested in, the aftermath of Alexander the Great's death. A key source for that was Arian, who wrote Alexander the Great's life. He also covered the immediate years after his death. And sadly, we only have small fragments of that huge work surviving, partially written from an epitome written more than a thousand years later in Byzantine times. How did ancient Greeks worship? Well, there were sanctuaries, there were temples, you would also have your household gods too, you would make offerings before a sea journey. In so many different contexts you'd have the Oracle of Delphi, the Oracle of Dodona, the sacred sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia too. So there are many different ways you could worship the gods. How did ancient Greek athletes train? Right, so as the Olympics go on and on and on, professional trainers, they emerge, you know, professionals taking part in the Olympics because there's no prize for second place. You want to win. Winning is everything. And there are even stories of certain people who didn't win going off and then living in absolute shame. But there is an iconic type of building associated with the ancient Greeks, and that is called the gymnasium. And you would find them in almost every ancient Greek town, gymnasia and there were running tracks huge in there, but there were also places where you could wrestle, you could practice various different disciplines that would have happened at the ancient Greek Olympics. And as those who partook in, let's say, the Olympics, they got more and more professional, they had to devote more and more of their time to perfecting their particular skill, whether it be running in armour or wrestling or pankration or discus throwing and so on. With that, you then get the emergence of ancient PTs, personal trainers, who would train with the person perhaps in the gymnasium or elsewhere to get them ready for the event. And that results in time with these professional athletes. Some of the best ones became the celebrities of their day. There's a famous figure from an Italian Greek city called Croton, Milo of Croton, uh, and he was renowned as one of the greatest athletes of all time. But you also hear of particular personal trainers who gained a massive reputation because of how good a trainer they were for these leading athletes in the Greek world. Who did ancient Greece fight with? Okay, there's quite a list. Romans, Egyptians, Persians, Babylonians, potentially in mercenary service, Thracians, Illyrians, Dardanians, Carthaginians, Samnites, Lucanians, Apulians, Nasamones in North Africa, Scythians in the north of the Black Sea, Indian, various different Indian people. So we're talking about Alexander the Great and his ultimate um, campaigns in the Indian subcontinent down the Indus River Valley. Gauls for the Massaliots that were living in Massalia, Iberians for those living in northeastern Spain, maybe even at times Etruscans, the Battle of the Olalia. The Greeks fought so many different peoples. Sometimes the Greeks fought in the armies of others. The classic example, for instance, is the Persians. There are many Greeks that fought against Alexander the Great and the Macedonians because they saw Alexander as a tyrant, as more of a threat to them than the Persians. So many Athenians, many people who had lived in area of Thebes and Attica, rather than side of Alexander the Great, they joined Darius and serve as mercenaries. And there were also times with the Persian Wars, it's not Persia against the Greeks, there are many Greeks fighting in the Persian army of Darius and Xerxes too. So if the Greeks weren't fighting against different peoples and civilizations, they were fighting against themselves. How did ancient Greek music sound? Music was incredibly popular in ancient Greece. Going to the theatre, like the athletes, you know, if you were a very good music player, you could become a celebrity of your day. There were various different instruments of the ancient Greeks. Perhaps the most iconic is the aulos, which were two single reeds played together. Certain Greek city-states did not like the aulos, like Athens. And Supposedly, the goddess Athena did not like the Aulos, but Sparta loved the Aulos. And there's even a tradition that the Spartans, they marched into battle, they marched on campaign to the song of the Aulos, of an Aulos player. 
Thebes as well, another enemy of the Athenians. They were big in the Aulos, and supposedly the best reeds for this instrument came from Lake Copias, which was in the region of Boeotia near Thebes. And one last thing on the Aulos is that they also found examples of it as far away as in the Kingdom of Kush, the River Nile in modern day southern Egypt, north Sudan, at the city of Meroe, which is really, really interesting. There are other instruments too. Of course, you have the lyre, Orpheus, one of the most famous figures from Greek mythology, and a series of other instruments too. I think there was a water organ, there were drums, pan pipes, and so on. And of course, there were the choirs of people singing too. But music is a huge part of ancient Greek culture. In an age you know, before Spotify, you would go to the theatre and you'd see these great performances, competitions, musical competitions. In regards to how they sounded, we can not only get a sense of that from archaeological reconstructions of, let's say, the Aulos, the Aoloi that have survived. James Lloyd has some brilliant reconstructions of those. But we also have musical notation survive. There is an amazing object called the Seikilos Stele. And on that is notation of an ancient Greek song. And having had a look at that notation, people today have been able to recreate how that song sounded. And there are some beautiful renditions of it surviving. It's like, da 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 da. Oh, that's Green Sleeves. <laughs> A great little quirky fact I love is that the music for the Greeks in the game Civilization is a rendition of the Seikilos Stele song. So yes, you even have musical notation surviving from ancient Greece. How often do you think about the Greek Empire? Let's not start this again. Hope you enjoyed me answering the most Googled questions about ancient Greece. Don't you worry, there'll be more coming your way in due course. If you want to learn more, if you want to check out history, then have a look at our YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, we've got lots on offer, stretching from ancient history all the way to Napoleon and the modern day. And also, if you want to stay in the ancient world, then check out my podcast, The Ancients.